Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to the King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop here at chess.com. And I'm bringing another installment of World Championship Wins, of featuring the first official World Championship played in 1886. That match began on Monday, January 11th in New York, and um, it moved to St. Louis after Tsukertort reached four wins. And it moved to New Orleans after Steinitz reached four wins. And we're going to see the fourth Steinitz win here. This game was played on February 10th, which would have been a Wednesday in 1886 in St. Louis. Now this is actually game nine of the match. Game eight was a draw, a relatively short draw. And I'm not showing any of the draws. I'm only showing games that ended up as uh, wins in the series, World Championship wins. So here we are. Steinitz has brought the score to three to four and still in favor of his opponent. But after this game, it will be tied. And the game started out, Zuckertort played once again d4, d5, and again the Queen's Gambit. And uh, just a reminder, the point of the Queen's Gambit is to strike immediately at the center uh, from the side. And even though the pawn is not protected and can be captured, it's not a real gambit because White can pretty easily recapture the pawn. Now the benefit of this line is that it um, fights to conquer the center. It puts immediate pressure on black. It gains space. However, white will have to spend time getting the pawn back in most cases. Uh, usually what happens is the bishop comes to d3 though before the pawn is captured and then has to burn a move but um, the opening also tends to provide less attacking chances on the black king and don't forget as we saw in the previous uh, game white can uh, black can counterattack the d4 pawn with the Tarash defense. So there's always that to uh, consider. So Steinitz plays e6, declining the gambit, and the queen's knight variation is played. Knight f6, then the three knights variation. Now the pawn is captured in the Vienna variation. And e3 is known as the quiet variation. Now after c5, bishop takes c4, transposes from queen's gambit to declined to queen's gambit accepted. This tabia is seen in the classical defense of the queen's gambit accepted. And that is the... Um, volume D, Section 26 of your Encyclopedia of Chess Openings. Now, this move, C takes D4, was pioneered by Steinitz, as were many moves. But it's only been played 20 times since this game was played. Um, by far the most common move... I mean, compared to the 20 times that Steinitz's move was played, a6 is played 715 times. And that move was introduced uh, by Giza Morozzi in a game against Lasker in Paris, year 1900. So 14 years ex post facto to the, the game at hand.
Um, let's see here. Where was I? Bishop takes c4, yes. Um, c takes d4. And then e takes d4. Bishop e7, both sides castle. Queen e2. Knight b d7. Bishop b3, knight b6. Now this move, bishop um, f4, has only been played one time since this game. Um, alternatively, bishop g5 is the top move in the database. And that move was introduced by Mikhail Botvinnik at Leningrad in 1938. And he was playing against Alexander Budo. But the Austrian Grandmaster Karl Schlechter preferred rook to d1 here. And I think that's the engine's favorite move. Uh, either rook d1, yeah, I think it's rook d1 that the engine preferred there. Um, and, but rook e1 has also been tried a few times. And the, the uh, only though since 1996, but uh, the most notable person that played this was Maurice Ashley. And we all know Maurice Ashley. If you watch any of the Grand Chess Tour, you know who Maurice Ashley is. And so he played Rook E1. Um, in Waikiki, Hawaii on July 27th, round seven of the United States Masters Tournament. And um, uh, interestingly enough, he, in round six, he defeated his colleague, Jennifer Shahadi. When I say colleague, again, I'm speaking in terms of Grand Chess Tour, St. Louis uh, Chess Club announcer. Jennifer Shahadi played in that event as well and was paired with Maurice in the sixth round. And she lost to Maurice there. Anyway, uh, none of that has anything to do with this game. But uh, Maurice Ashley did play Rook E1 from this Tabia. Uh, so uh, those are the more uh, common moves. Bishop F4 very rare and has only been played one time since then so knight b to d5 hits that bishop and um Zuckertort again chooses a less active less preferred move um i forget who it was that played bishop g5 now as a matter of preference. Um, I can't call it to my mind all of a sudden, but uh, bishop g5 is the most common move in the, in the database. And who pioneered that move? I just cannot remember, I apologize. So anyway, when we come to queen a5, we reach the first unique position. In other words, the first position, the first tabia that has not been repeated in history. So this is unique to this game and this game only. Rook a to c1, occupying the open file with his rook. Bishop to d7. Knight to e5. And rook f to d8. You know, whenever I'm playing my rooks and trying to decide which one to move to a given square, I invariably pick the wrong rook. So I could be wrong when I say that I would prefer rook a to d8 
And for the simple reason that this knight is attacking this pawn. And you might want some help there, but I don't know. I'm certainly no Wilhelm Steinitz. But queen f3. Now bishop e8. And rook f to e1. Rook a to c8. And that might be more to the point of rook f to d8. Uh, because now you've got the other rook standing across from its counterpart. Bishop h4. Knight takes c3. Pawn takes c3. Queen to c7. Now queen to d3 steps in the view of this rook. I'm not too keen on that. A more active move in my mind is going to be bishop g3 eyeballing the opposing queen ready to launch your knight somewhere to create a discovered attack. Now, of course, uh, yeah, Black would not let that happen. He'd probably play something like bishop d6. But uh, the point being, White's um, a little more sound with bishop g3. So queen d3. Not that this is a blunder or anything. I'm just speaking in, on principle here. So knight to d5. Bishop takes bishop and queen takes bishop. Bishop takes knight and rook takes knight. Uh, and rook takes bishop, I should say. c4 attacks the rook. He retreats back to d8. Now rook to e3 and queen to d6, doubling up on the d-pawn. And this is one of those games where Steinitz is demonstrating the philosophy of accumulation of advantages. Not finding anything real major, just little by little. F6 is played. Um, rook H3. Just saying, go ahead and take my pawn. I'm going to super attack over here. Or not my pawn, my knight. Well, H6 was played. If he takes the knight, you can see... Um, you just, well, you can't move to f7 because you're mated in three moves. King f7, rook f3, check. King e7, queen takes g7. And now you have a swallowtail's checkmate. So that wouldn't be possible. So your only other square is king f8. And uh, from here, I mean, okay, he might probably hold a draw here. But um, he's certainly exposed. In this position, uh, after rook f3 check, the bishop can block. And so <clears throat> black can hold on here. And probably this ends up being drawn. Okay, so in any case, in the game, Steinitz played h6, not uh, willing to venture into that. Knight to g4, queen to f4 now, and the knight is undefended, so knight to e3, bishop to a4 attacking the rook and instead of moving this rook to safety white attacks with a counterattack queen d6 now rook d2 and now bishop c6 
Well, here, again, you want to continue to um, attack. So, Rook G3 is not the best choice here. Um, a better choice in this position is pawn to d5. Cut that bishop off. Send him back. And then rook uh, g3. And this is going to hold. If you um, if he takes the pawn knight f5 hits the queen and then rook g3 and that's going to force g5 and this is equal as well so okay rook g3 f5 and now the difficulty is compounded by another mistake, rook g6. The better line here is c5, hit the queen, queen e7, knight c4, bishop b5, queen b3, trade pay minors, and then after rook takes, queen takes, it's a pretty clever tactic. If you have the back rank weakness, you have to give the king somewhere to go. And black's ahead of pawn, but white's, you know, got much better chances of holding on to this. So with rook g6, though, now bishop e4, attacks the queen, queen b3. King h7. Now he played c5. And now rook takes c5. And as you can see, um, you've got this back rank weakness here. So he attacks this. He's protected by the queen. But check is given. Now... He moved the knight to the wrong blocking square. You really don't want to tie this rook down on d2. So a better choice is going to be knight f1, keeping the rook at liberty. I mean, in any case, now you can see white is falling apart here in either case. And black has got the initiative and is probably winning. Queen f4 immediately begins to punctuate the problems in uh, white's position. And queen b2 just really is all she wrote for, for white. Um, okay, he's still losing, but the better try is queen e3. And then, of course, bishop c2 puts a punctuation mark on the error of knight d1. But, okay, you're down a piece. You've got a couple of center pawns. You're probably losing anyway. But after queen b2, now rook b1, queen moves to c3, rook c8... And as you can see, the, the rook is willing to give itself up. He, he picked off this bishop here with a hit on the queen, but then the queen just captures. And then what, what do you do? And the, the rook, if you take the rook, well, you're just dead. You're mated because... Now the, the knight's defender is removed. You still have this back rank weakness. I mean, there's nothing left. You got the bishop aiming here, the rook aiming here. There's nothing left. The only thing um, 
White can do is throw in some spite checks and stall with moves like, uh, you know, check here. And that'll stall, but White's as good as gone here any second now. So, uh, that, in, in any case, here, um, White resigned. And the continuation that would, could be played after this, if White hadn't resigned, you know, makes it clear you got that back rank weakness. And so you're going to lose both your Rook and your Knight because you can't move either with the back rank weakness. And so with the two Rooks, it's going to be very easy to win. We'll just show the moves. Forcing over, checkmate. This wasn't the best game these two played. Neither of them broke 90. Accuracy. White's accuracy was 81.94. And he had a best move ratio of 42.1%. Black's... Um, accuracy was 89.53, finding the best move 47.4% of the time. Now, the next game will, on the calendar, comes in two weeks. Uh, as they make their way to New Orleans, the score now tied. Four wins to four wins. The one draw that they've had so far... Um, not counting. So, um, the score's evened up, but Steinitz really has the momentum winning three in a row here. Now, when Zuckertort had the momentum and they changed venue, that gave Steinitz a chance to recoup and come back with a vengeance. So theoretically, a two week break might help Zuckertort recoup. Well, we know historically that doesn't happen, but I trust you'll tune in again to, uh, to um, enjoy the games that, that are played. Now, I want to pitch the channel. So let me invite you to donate. And there's the link. www.paypal.com slash paypalme2 slash kingsbishopphx. And if you'll contribute... $25 or more, I'll be glad to make a video of any game that you submit. It can be one of your own games. It can be a Grandmaster game. Any game of interest, you submit it to me, um, and I'll make a video out of it. Several um, people have commissioned videos, and you can too. If you'll donate $25 or more to the channel... Um, we're offering that as a sort of premium incentive uh, to contribute. Now, of course, um, all donations are welcome. And um, if you just want to support the channel, that's received with gratitude as well. So until next time, have a great day and play some great chess. Bye now.